Hello, friendship. My name is Deacon Craig Kenny, and I'm bringing Terrific Tuesday to you today. And before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Most gracious and heavenly Father, once again, we come to you today thanking and praising you. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word, to hear your word. Father, we thank you for delivering us. We thank you for the many blessings you've bestowed upon us. Lord, we ask that you be with us on today. We ask that you guide the speaker, influence the listeners, so that your word will be illuminated. Father, we ask that you just be with us on today, guide and direct. These things we ask it all in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today's lesson comes from Matthew, second chapter, verses 7 through 15. The topic of today is call to worship. I will read the verse before we dig into the lesson. I'll be reading the NIV version. Starting at verse 7, the second chapter of Matthew reads, Then Herod called the Magi, secretly and found out from them that the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I can, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it arose went ahead of them until they stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and mirth. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you to. Tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt. Where he stayed until the death of Herod, and was fulfilled with was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. May the Lord add a blessing to its already blessed word. So as a part of, of digging into the lesson, this part of Matthew, the story of Jesus' birth, in which the wise man arrived in Bethlehem. Now there are two misconceptions to clear up about these wise men. The first, the misconception is many people believe that there are three wise men. And for the reason for that is there were three specific gifts brought. We really don't know how many wise men there were. The second misconception is we often see this and it's noticeable in the nativity scenes. It shows the wise men arriving at the time of Jesus' birth. But by the time they, wrote, they arrived, the child, Joseph and Mary, they were already living in the house. So just to give you a, a background for it, the, um, the wise men, once they got there, Jesus was a toddler. He was no longer a baby. But these wise men, they traveled. They traveled from the east looking for the king of Jews. They saw his star and were coming to worship him. The Greek term for these men are magi, which means they were astrologers. Now, here comes King Herod, also known as Herod the Great. Now, King Herod was along the line of many kings of Herod's in his generation, his family. So he wanted to uphold the family name by staying king. King Herod was a Jew, wasn't a Jew, but this is who the Romans had uh, 
pick over the ruler of the Jews. So when Herod heard that the wise men were going to see Jesus, he was deeply disturbed. As far as he was concerned, there was only room for one king, and that was him. So Herod learned from the scriptures that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So he secretly called the wise men. And when he called them in, he wanted to get an accurate time of when the star appeared and rising in the east. After talking with the wise men in their private meeting, he asked them to search carefully for the child and report back to him so that he could worship this new king. But we know that Herod had ulterior motives. He wasn't going to allow anyone to take his kingdom. The wise men, they received word from Herod and they continued on their way, on their search by following the star. The star stopped over a place where the child was. Now, when the wise men got there, they were overwhelmed with joy. They were overwhelmed with joy to see the child, to see him. Then the wise men did three things. The first thing they did is they fell down to their knees before the child. The second thing, they worshiped him. And the third thing was they opened their bags of gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and they gave them to the child. Now let's think about this for a minute. These men had traveled an incredible distance for perhaps as long as two years just to worship the king. But they knew he, this child, the king of the Jews, they knew he was worth it. Ask yourself, how much are you willing to be inconvenienced to worship the king of kings? They followed the star continuously, believing it would take them to a place where the child was. The human part of me imagines that at some point, they probably had to grow tired or even question if it was worth it. They probably even said, would it end up like this, like they hoped? But instead of stopping, they continued on. And when they arrived, they were thrilled. Matthew makes it a point in verse 10 to inform us of how excited they were just upon their arrival. It says they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. True worship can't be contained. True worship cannot be held down. True worship can't be mistaken, and it can't be held back. Ask yourself again, is this how I show up to worship? Do I have that excitement that these men had? Do I have that excitement? Or do I just do it because it's expected? It's ex- is it expected of me to worship when I come into the sanctuary? Is it expected of me to worship when I hear my favorite song? Do the right thing. Think it would be only for an hour out of my day and you know, I can get my day back. Think about this. Is my excitement to worship lessened by people? Is it lessened by circumstances, problems of the world, problems in our lives? We have to think about that. Do we lessen our worship because of other things? None of those issues seem to bother these men. They sought the child, and they were overjoyed and they, that they found him. They fell down, bowed, and worshiped him. The act of bowing or kneeling is a way of demonstrating our humility and devotion. When we bow lowly before the Lord, we acknowledge his power. And we make sure everyone knows who you esteem, who you respect, and reverence. So you bow down and humble yourself to lift up someone else for far more worthy who is far more worthy. When we worship, we declare the greatness of someone or something. They worship Jesus, not for what he did for them, 
because he was still just a child, but for who he was. They worshiped him before, because of who he was. Remember, we were created to worship him. That was, for our, that was our creation. We were created to worship Jesus. Ask yourself again, who or what am I bowing down to worship? Is the focus on Jesus Christ? Are we worshiping man? Are we worshiping our husbands? Are we worshiping our wives? Are we worshiping our jobs? Is the focus on Jesus Christ? Or do we care more about the thoughts and the needs of others? Traditions or the pressures of life? Then recognize the gifts that were bought, the gold, the frankincense, the myrrh. Gold, it recognizes Jesus as God. It was a gift for royalty. The gold was not just a piece of gold like a necklace or a ring. It was enough gold for Jesus and Mary to live the whole while they were going from Jerusalem to Egypt. Frankincense. It recognized Jesus as the perfect lamb sacrifice. It was a gift for God and his divine nature. Frankincense often accompanied the lamb offering and the temple sacrifices. Myrrh, it recognizes Jesus as Savior and our healer. Myrrh is an ingredient that is used in anointing oil and often used for burials. Now, this probably was considered an odd gift to be presented to a child. But the scriptures foretold that the suffering of Jesus would endure, that when he went through great suffering for our healing and salvation. So he did not take it the easy way out. He did not take the world that everybody traveled. The wise men gave these expensive gifts as worthy acknowledgement for our future king. Your gifts, your offerings. It's a part of worship. Your tithes, your offerings, it's a part of worship. This is the essence of true worship, honoring God for who he is and being willing to have him what is valuable, give him what is valuable to you. We worship God because he is the perfect, just, and almighty creature of all the universe, worthy to the best you have to give. Ask yourself, do I give Jesus my best offering? Or do I give him the leftovers? Do I pay all my bills, get food, maybe go out to dinner and I give him what's left over on Sunday? Ask yourself. In verse 12, since the wise men have faithfully sought the Savior and they received him, inside, they received inside information. They were warned in a dream that Herod was angered and, because they didn't return to him. So instead of returning to him, they returned home going another route. Finding Jesus may mean that your life must take a different direction. One that is open to his word and responsive to his leadership. How many know that when you are in tune with the Lord, you can hear and recognize his voice? He will guide you in the direction that you must go. But you have to be in tune. You have to listen to his word. You have to listen to his voice and recognize that is his voice. Ask yourself again, in what way has Jesus affected the direction of your life? If you're in tune, he's directed and he's affected your life in a different direction than it would have been. 
verse 13. In verse 13, it talks about the angel of the Lord appearing to Joseph in a dream. Joseph was obedient to the Lord's word, and he received further information and understanding. He was warned to flee to Egypt with Mary and Jesus for safety from Herod. When you obey God's word, when you obey his revelation, you get further divine illumination and to your destination. Now, when you hear his word, he'll give you the direction you should go. Let's take a look at Moses. When Moses was guided to, guiding the Israelites out of Egypt on the way to the promised land, he had to obey God's word. That was the only way he was able to be successful. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24 states that a time will come. However, indeed, it is already here. When the true and genuine worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking just people as these and his worshipers. God is the spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We're called to worship. When we worship and are obedient to God, we as the body of Christ are unstoppable. We are created to worship God. Down here on earth is just a glimpse, a warm up of what it's going to be like when we all get to heaven. The hymn says, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all get to heaven and see Jesus will sing and shout the victory. Thank you. God bless you.